last name starts with A. I love A. If all that it brings to do become the first quarter. My quarter is also more B as well as A. So I will this talk will be about A. So the plan is um this talk will be about bridging two topics, one in algebra and one in geometry. So on the algebra side, I will tell you about Kruber, Donald's and Thomas, Kruber, the theme variant. And so I will tell you about our work from last year, showing you how to calculate the invariants using an attractive poetry formula. And on the geometry side, so I will tell you about counts of curves. So this is more what I have been doing. Uh, and I will tell you how to pass from equivalence to toric varieties and how to set up a problem to count curves in toric varieties given the data of a equivalent with some additional combinatorial information. And the upshot will be to tell you how Kruva DT variants are related to these curve counts, which we which kill us so from all written invariants and toric variety. Okay, I will just briefly review the Kruva DT theory. So I will just tell you what are Kruvas, how do we define Kruva DT variants? A Kruva is a finite oriented graph Q, which may look like this. It has a set of vertices, in this case, one, two, three, which we do not like Q0. And it has a set of arrows, which we do not like Q1. When you have a Kruva, you can talk about, talk of a representation of a Kruva. A representation of a Kruva is an assignment of a vector space to every vertex. Like if you have this simple Kruva, the three vertices, you can assign vector spaces to each vertex. And in addition, an assignment to a linear transformation for each arrow between these vector spaces. And when we talk of Kruva representations, we usually fix the dimension vector gamma, which corresponds to the dimensions of the vector spaces you associate to vertices. Like if you have C here, C to C, this will describe a Kruva representation of dimension one to one. And this is an element of the positive lattice and where N is the lattice C to the number of vertices of your Kruva. So there is a natural notion of morphisms and isomorphisms between two Kruva representations. It follows like if you have another copy of this, you can ask for some commutative diagrams and maps. So we will consider Kruva representations or Kruva representations up to isomorphism. And in addition, we will care about stable Kruva or semi-stable Kruva representations. So there is this notion of stability due to King. It says if you have a Kruva representation of any fixed dimension gamma, if you denote the dual space to your lattice M, which was the lattice C to the number of vertices by M, and the associated real vector space by MR, then any element theta in this space, which lives in gamma per, is a stability parameter. And for such a stability parameter for an element theta here, you call your Kruva representation stable if for any sub-representation, the pairing of theta and the dimension vector of the sub-representation is smaller than zero, and you call it semi-stable if it's smaller or equal to zero. So what we do is we will consider this notion of stability and we will try to understand the moduli space of all theta semi-stable Kruva representations of given dimension gamma. So we have, we fix a dimension vector gamma, we fix a stability parameter theta for a Kruva and we look at this moduli space. And nice situations, which will be very rare in the situation, for instance, when this moduli space might be smooth, we define the Kruva DT invariant as the topological Euler characteristics of this moduli space, which is alternating sum of the beta numbers of this moduli space. And the most important thing about Kruva DT invariants is um, there's a piecewise constant dependence on the stability parameter theta. So if you look at your dimension vector gamma and gamma perp in the dual space, 
then there's a wall and chamber structure. So as long as you're inside one of these green chambers that I illustrated, your equality invariance for any theta here will be the same. But if you cross one, there will be some change, which can be described using some wall crossing structure, wall crossing uh, due to conservative cycle. Here is just a simple example. If you look at the n chronic equivalent, which is the equivalent of just the two vertices and n arrows between them, then if you fix our dimension vector to be gamma to be one one for any theta one minus theta one, this theta is in gamma curve. And one can show that if you take theta one smaller than zero, you can verify the king stability. There won't be anything semi-stable, so we take theta one bigger than zero. Then the modular space of all clear representations for any theta like this will be isomorphic to CPN minus one. The reason being, uh, you're essentially having a copy of C here, a C here, and a map between C and C is determined by a complex number, and you don't want all of them to be zero to ensure some instability. So n complex numbers, which are not altogether zero, gives you CPM minus zero. Okay, so when we talk about quillas, so far I gave ju just very simple examples, like here there were no loops or so, but I just want to point out generally, we might have loops in this quilla, there might be cycles. So in addition, you need to consider the path algebra of the quilla, which is the combinations of linear combinations of the path. And then, you end up equivalent with the choice of a potential function, potential in the spot algebra, which is just a formal linear combination of not parts, but cycles. So whenever you have a cycle, you can define a potential function. I will not talk too much about this because for our main result, it won't play a crucial role, but just, it will be ju just to say the most general definition of what equivalent DT invariants are, if you fix a potential, which is a formal linear combination of cycles C's, then um, if by now for any cycle C, you can define the trace function. It is a function defined by considering all the linear maps associated to arrows forming the cycle, and then you just take the trace of this composition, and then you define the trace of your potential. And then what you do is you look at the critical locus of your trace function inside your moduli space. And again, in most cases, you can just set your equivalent DT invariance to be the alternating sum of 30 numbers of your critical locus. So this is what you do to define equivalent DT whenever you have cycles. And here is the most general definition it's um, using quite some technical tools. So whenever you have a quiver with cycles, so you have this additional potential. And in this situation, um, your critical locus is not smooth. Then to make that, then you need to consider alternating some of the numbers where you consider the sheaf cohomology groups, and you take into account the sheaf, which is given by the intersection cohomology sheaf, it's not an honest sheaf, it's a perverse sheaf, but in situations your modular space is smooth, the intersection cohomology sheaf is, will just be the constant sheaf with sort Q. And then to pull back this intersection cohomology sheaf on the modular space, you apply a vanishing cycle factor to it, you obtain a sheaf on the critical locus. So these are all technical details that appeared on many people's works that I noted some here. And then you obtain your equivalent DT invariance uh, this, uh, with this formula. And generally, final remark, because we will calculate these invariants using wall crossing just for computational convenience, we will not work with equivalent DT invariance, but we will work with rational DT invariance. So the data of all equivalent DT invariance is equivalent to the data of all rational equivalent DT invariance. They're just defined by 
the usual set some additional factor in front, front of the fluid ET invariants, which show up whenever you do ball growth cycle. Okay, so this is the Quiver DT site. It has a pretty technical definition, many ingredients here. So let me just say that um, there are many people um, among physicists who do calculate concretely these invariants. So here is a paper that I took this table from. If you look at the tree chronic approval, which appears in this paper in the context of n equal 240 SU3 super youngness theory, something far beyond my expertise, but I just wanted to show you these numbers done for uh, the fluidity ET invariants can be calculated. So I'm trying to uh, motivate that, well, their mathematical definition is somewhat technical. They do are important invariants they appear in a lot of situations. So if you look at COVID-18 variants, they appear on the physics side on supersymmetric quantum mechanics. They correspond to counts of EPS particles or supersymmetric ground states. And on more the mathematical side, in some situations, they correspond to geometric EP invariants, which have to do with counts of coherent sheaves and Columbia tree folds, which on the mirror symmetry is expected to give you um, the council special Lagrangians in Columbia tree folds. So they appear both in physics and on the math side. Sounds like light -like. Okay, so the question we asked last year with Pyrrhic is, is there a primitive set of DT invariants which we can use, which we understand well, a simple set of DT invariants from which we could determine all the DT invariants? And we showed, yes, we can calculate all quibble DT invariants using wall crossing and flow trees that appear in the wall crossing or scattering diagrams from a simple set of attractor DT invariants. So I will first tell you how this works. It will be useful to relate the calculation of fluid DT invariants to concept curves. Okay, so to tell the main result, I need to pick some notations. So for our lattice sum, I'm going to choose a basis S1 to SQ0, where Q0 is the number of vertices in your quiver. I define a skew symmetric uh, uniform on the lattice by um, the pairing is ISJ will be defined by AIJ minus AJI, where IJ is the number of arrows from I to J, and similarly for AJI. For a fixed dimension vector gamma, there is a particular point in the dual lattice and the associated real vector space of the dual lattice, which is obtained by the contraction of the skew symmetric form that I defined with gamma. And this point in the dual lattice is called the attractor point, and the chamber containing this point is called the attractor chamber. And for any small perturbation of this attractive point, which is generic in some suitable sense, one can define the attractive DT invariance as the DT invariance of this small perturbation gives you a stability parameter theta as the DT invariance for the stability parameter theta. And these attractive DT invariants have been studied by various people that I wrote some of their names here. And some nice property about these is that you might end up with your attractor point in MR to be on some wall, but you can perturb a little bit to lie inside the chamber. And the attractor DT invariants won't really depend on this perturbation. All right, so the attractor DT invariants are nice rather simple DT invariants to study. There is a theorem due to John Gritchen, and it was generalized by Mark Moe. Um, it says if you have an acyclic quiver, then the attracted ET invariants are all one or zero. They are just one if you take your gamma to be one of the basis vectors of your lattice, so of the form zero, 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 just one at one place and zero, zero, zero again then it will be one. This is not very difficult to see. If you have just one here, you imagine on some vertex, you have just a copy of C and all maps are zero. So your moduli space of your representations will just be a point. 
and all the characteristics would be one. But the difficult thing to see is for everything else, for any other dimension vector, you get zero. And it's a conjecture which is proven for P2 now. The conjecture due to Bujar, Marshall, Piolin, and Moscow, Piolin, says that if you have a local dot pixel surface, which is a canonical bound lower dot pixel surface, then there is some recipe to construct a clue with the additional data of the potential function such that the derived bounded category of coherent cheese will be equal to the category of representations of your clue. And um, then the conjecture is all attractive ET variants will be zero again, unless again, either if your dimension vector is one of the basis vectors, in which case they will again be one, similar to above, or if your dimension vector is a multiple of a close of a point, in which case your attractive ET variants will be determined concretely as the other characteristic of your surface. And this conjecture was proven by. Uh, Pirik and his French collaborator. Okay, so, yeah. Yes, and here, uh, so your gamma lives on the lattice N, and here I'm identifying the cohomology of uh, my surface with the lattice, and I'm using some identification. Uh, under this correspondence here, the close of a point, you have all dimension vectors once. Is this the question? Yes, I think so. Is Kiri here? He puts the conjecture. Maybe he can confirm. Okay. So, yes, I think that's true. Yes. Okay. So, um, I want to tell you how do we use attractor plots to calculate the uh, clever DT invariants. So how do we obtain general DT invariants um, starting from just a simple attractor DT invariants? And if you start, so if you start with a clever with a potential, if you fix your dimension vector gamma and the stability parameter and gamma proof, then Konsevich Seublemann already in their work dating back to 2013, uh, showed a formula saying that you can obtain general equivalent DT variants as a linear combination of attractor DT variants, where there is a summation over all possible decompositions of your dimension vector gamma. So you decompose your dimension vector into several vectors. You take the sum of all possible decomposition and there's coefficients appearing depending on this decomposition. There is an automorphism group, it's sort of permutation symmetries of this decomposition. And I will tell you what these coefficients are in a minute in a version of this formula. They can be combinatorially determined just as a sum of a trees, which are called attractive law trees. So just to give a picture, so you have your um, space M obtained by the dual to your lattice M, which is D to the number of vertices you have for dimension vector gamma perp. There live your stability parameters. You have your attractor point, which determines the direction. So you can imagine defining a tree starting at the stability point going in the direction of the attractor vector determined by the attractor point. And whenever you hit some, Whenever you decompose gamma, say into gamma one plus gamma four into this, your um, tree will bifurcate. So you can continue in this decomposition and the directions of these new uh, attractor points and these new chambers. So we will imagine this as part of a wall and chamber structure. So the lines where you hit will be the walls. Whenever you hit a wall, your flow tree bifurcates. So this is an example of a particular flow tree starting at theta and flowing in the direction determined by attractor points. 
And here, as you see, it could be of arbitrary valency. Here, there's a four-valent vertex. It could be of arbitrary valency, which makes it difficult to keep track of the COM networks and COM such trees. So just a remark, nonetheless, attractive flow trees are very much related to tropical trees by their construction. They satisfy a balancing condition at the vertices. And our goal was to sort of perturb them so we can relate to more standard trivalent trees and relate them to pair pumps. Yes, the valency is bounded by uh, so there if you so you the base of decomposing gamma. So you look at so here I decompose gamma into gamma one plus gamma four. So you fix your dimension vector gamma. Uh, so there is a maximal length of the decomposition that's bounded by that. Okay, so we will turn this formula into a version of this formula that we proved where we say we don't need to worry about higher valent flow trees. We can just look at trivalent things. So the theorem we proved is a version of the flow tree formula with Pyrrhic. We say if you have a quiver with a potential, you fix a dimension vector, you fix a stability parameter, then you can determine all your quiver DT invariants as the sum of all your decompositions of your dimension vector, and you have your attractive ET invariants, and you have some coefficients again. Again, these coefficients have some combinatorial description in terms of this time binary trees. So they will be determined by counting things over binary trees. So this is a binary tree. Each time there is a flaw from the root, each time you flaw, every vertex is trivalent. And we're considering binary trees whose leaves are decorated by elements appearing in this decomposition. So this simple version of the track of flow tree formula comes to the was conjectured by Alexandra Pioli. And um, we proved it using flow structures around the same time there was another ice crew using operates, which is due to most dollars. Okay, so I will tell you what these coefficients are. How do we determine these coefficients here in terms of binary trees? So these coefficients, if are theta, once you have a decomposition, are given as a sum of all binary trees that are leaves decorated by gamma one, gamma n. There are some horrible signs coming up. Epsilon, theta, tilde, TRV are signs either they're minus one, zero, or one. And I will we describe these using some flows. I will not tell you how they are concretely described. It's, um, one needs to keep track of them. It has to do with the realizability of your tropical tree C sign. And then apart from the signs, there's just the pairing using your skew symmetric form. You evaluate gamma V prime, gamma V prime prime, and V prime, V prime prime for any vertex V are just the children of this vertex. So here, if you have a vertex V, V prime, V prime prime will just be the two children of your vertex. So then you take the product of all V of this pairing where you evaluate the gammas corresponding to the children of your vertex. Yes, that's correct. And yes, so that's 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 a subtlety. Uh, we handle whenever we have repetitions, we need to they, they do appear and we need to go to larger space to be able to do these perturbations and describe the sign. So I will tell you in a minute how we do that when we have repetitions. So that makes it whenever we have repetitions, that makes things more technical. And let me just assume in the simple case, as Morat said, if we, if we may not have any repetition. Um, okay. Okay, if we may have repetition, if gamma one gamma R is not a basis, we need to work with a bigger lattice. And then 
we need to do these perturbations in a bigger lattice uh, where we define an Q symmetric form and the bigger lattice. And then the science, the, type, the description of science will depend on this new skew symmetric form because in other repetitions, you cannot do the initial perturbations you described in the usual lattice. Okay, so there's some technicalities here. I will not spend much time on this. Let me just give an example. In the simple case, when your gamma is one, one, just one, one. So there is only one decomposition to one, zero and zero, one. And in this case, there are only, there is just this trivial tree and one binary tree corresponding to this decomposition where you decompose one, one into one, zero and zero, one. And then uh, if we again look at the Kuva DT invariance for the Ankh-Kronik Kuva, by the formula I just showed you, so for the trivial decomposition, the coefficients will always just be one. And for this decomposition into gamma one, gamma two, you calculate your coefficients by there's some sign times you evaluate your skew symmetric form at the two children of gamma, in this case, which are one, zero, zero, one. We calculate in this example the sign to be minus one. And if you evaluate skew symmetric form at these two, uh, vectors appearing in the decomposition and the n from a forward by the definition of the fused matrix form, you have n arrows, you get n. So eventually you find your F2 to be n minus one times n. And as I expected, as the Euler characteristic of CPN in this case, is, uh, given this, as expected, you're getting your equivalent ET invariance and in this simple situation. Okay, so this was just to illustrate So we do obtain these Kruger DT variants just by counting flow trees, which are binary, and using the skew symmetric form, associating a number to every such flow tree uh, for every decomposition. Okay, so the main goal of this talk that I promised that I will tell you was the correspondence. How can we relate uh, to the DT invariants to counts of curves and Fourier varieties? So more concretely, I will tell you how to relate these coefficients appearing in the DT formula, which tell you how to obtain our DT invariants in terms of attractive invariants to counts of rational curves and Fourier varieties obtained from the Kua. So here's the setup of the counting problem. So I'm going to tell you how to construct the toric variety out of a Kula of given dimension vector gamma. So I fix any decomposition of gamma, as in the flow tree formula, for any decomposition, there will be a curve count, and then I will sum over all possible decompositions. Similar idea. So for any decomposition, I look at a toric fan in MR. I want a smooth projective toric variety whose fun contains all of the rays determined by contracting the skew symmetric form along gamma i, where gamma i is anything that appears in this decomposition. So you decompose your gamma, like in the previous example, if you, your gamma is 1, 1, gamma 1 could be 1, 0, gamma 2 could be 0, 1. And if you use the, if you contract your skew symmetric form, you obtain a vector from both one zero and zero one and the dual. And you want to construct a form containing those, so, so you obtain a ray uh, with primitive direction these, and you want a form which contains both of these rays. A priori, your form might not be smooth, complete, but then you can always add rays to it to turn it into the kind of a smooth projective for variety. And I think additional arrays is not gonna change our result in the curve counting side because the counts we will describe will be invariant under birational blow-ups. Okay. So I described the historic variety out of the data of Akua with fixed dimension vector gamma. And my counting problem is stated here. I'm interested in counting genus zero stable maps to the historic variety with R plus one marked points. R is the number of vectors that appear in my decomposition. 
and I impose these conditions that I want all PIs marked points to map to the hypersurface HI, where HI is the hypersurface inside the toric boundary divisor. Given by this concrete equation, I take C to the gamma I, the primitive vector for gamma I equal to constant. And I restrict this equation to my divisors di, so I get hypersurfaces here. So I want all my PIs mapped to these hypersurfaces for all but the last point. And I impose the contact order for the image of all these PIs to be equal to the divisibility of my vector gamma i, of my vector obtained by the contraction of the skew symmetric form along gamma i. Okay, so this is a counting problem I just wrote in dimension two. In general, we will be at arbitrary dimension. And dimension two, this counting problem is easy to handle because if you look at your moduli space, it will be zero dimensional. But your toric variety will be having dimension as much as like whatever your number of vertices are, at least if your skew symmetric form is non degenerate. And um, in higher dimensions, this counting problem is challenging because you will have higher dimensional moduli spaces. You can imagine if you have one dimension higher, if you multiply this with P1, you will have a family of such curves, one dimensional family of such curves. And what we did is try to make sense of this counting problem when you have higher dimensional moduli spaces and to obtain numbers which be related to the Deacon variant. Yes, for every choice of dimension vector, I define a different toric variety, a different counting problem, and eventually, similarly to while defining these coefficients, I summed up over all possible decompositions, I will sum up over all the grammar written and variant of different counting problems. The boundary devices are in the stored variety are correspond the devices corresponding to the stray gamma ions are obtained by the gamma ions. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Okay, so are there any other questions at this point? I will go ahead. I will dive into safe photos of block geometry, which will enable us to understand how to count such curves. Okay, so to count such curves, we need to do log geometry. This is some setup. It's a generalization of a theory relative from our written theory of Juni, developed by Abramovich and Gross Siebert. Juni was interested in counting curves. Whenever you have a divisor, we impose some tangency conditions along the smooth divisor. And the setup of Abramovich and Gross Siebert this uh, this count is set up set up is slightly more different. It uses um, something called log structures. So and the divisor D is not necessarily smooth in the setup. It can be simple normal crossing or more general divisors. And I will tell you how to define these counts in the more general situation using log structures. So to tell you what Zokromovitz in theory is, which, has to do, which is the count of such curves with tangency conditions, I need to tell you what log geometry is. By definition, a log structure on a scheme is a sheaf of monads together with a map to the structure sheaf, which restricts to an isomorphism on the invertible elements of the structure sheaf. In a minute, I will give you an example. There can be many log structures on a scheme, and it has a discrete and a non discrete part of the log structure. The non discrete part, which we denote by M bar, is just a sheaf of monoids where you quotient out the invertible elements, the isomorphic copy of your invertible element. And only this non discrete part, only the sorry, discrete part, which is the Gauss sheaf, is gonna mostly be used while telling you how to do tropical geometry. Uh, and in particular, how to describe the tropicalization, we describe the tropicalization of a scheme and of such a structure as the clone complex, 
which is a union of cons from the cost sheet, which sold eta for any generic point eta uh, to R0 greater or equal to zero. And then you need to identify these cones using some generalization maps. Here is an example. The typical log structure we will work with is called the divisorial log structure. In this case, when you have a scheme X and the device the D in it, you can embed a complement into X by a map J, and you can look at define your log structure to be the sheaf defined this way. It is the sheaf of regular functions on X, which are invertible away from D. And as an example, if you just look at the affine line with the point zero in it, all such regular functions invertible away from zero are of the form H times T to N where H is an invertible element. If you look at the ghost sheaf, you just forget the H, you just have T to N, and you can map T to N just by considering its power N by a map similar to the logarithm. So that's why particularly it's a log structure. You will always use such identifications to work with non-monoids generally. And in this case, if you look at home N to R greater or equal zero, your tropicalization will just be R greater or equal zero. And in general, whenever you consider a toric variety with the toric boundary device and this log structure, the tropicalization will give you the toric. Whenever you have a log structure like an A1, if you have a sub scheme, you can pull back your log structure. And then, for instance, if you pull it back to zero, you get a log structure on the point. And here is the definition so of a stable log map. So whenever we have, um, stable map C to X, we end up both C and X with um, log structures. And we be both, uh, we be both of these log schemes now or some log points. And the log points are over the, the target is based on if, you were, if you're working on a parameter, one parameter family in a degeneration situation or not. And this log point is determined purely by the combinatorial type of your map. So I will tell you what is the combinatorial type is. Whenever you have a map, the combinatorial type is just determined by the dual intersection graph and the image of the vertices, edges, and flex and the dual into the dual intersection graph together with the contact data uh, of the marked points. And Given a combinatorial type, there is a way to construct a monoid. It just says for every node of your curve, you get a copy of N. And for every irreducible components, you get some additional monoids. So the combinatorial type gives you a monoid purely based on this combinatorial type, which we call the basic monoids in this theory. A stable log map is basic if this base over the curve is equal to basic monoid just determined from the combinatorial type. Abramovich and Gross-Siebert prove that the moduli space of all basic stable log maps is a delin Mumford stack. Moreover, it's a proper delin Mumford stack and there's a virtual fundamental class. So the degree of the virtual fundamental class gives you what we call log Gramovich invariance. Okay, so it's a result of Nishino and Siebert, you can count, you, you can obtain log Gramovitan invariance by counts of tropical curves. And this is like Sabrina will talk in the afternoon about the similar correspondence due to Mikaki in dimension two. This is a higher dimensional setup. So in any higher dimensional torque variety, he tells you how to count log Gramovitan invariance in terms of tropical curve counts. Uh, what we want to do is to generalize the theorem. So in this situation of Nishino Z, but your modular space is zero dimensional, everything is rigid. What we want to do is generalize the theorem where we count maps whose tropicalizations are not rigid, but one dimensional families. We want to trace out the whole chamber by deforming our attractive flow trees. So our combinatorial types will not just be the tropicalizations you work with will not just be trees, but families of trees. And then we need to make sense of uh, such a count. So our first result shows that if you have some general hypersurface general constraints, 
whose tropicalization as a demon is two dimensional family where D is the number of vertices in your curve, you start with to define your anamorphic problem. But then, if you look at all the log maps whose tropicalization is this family of tropical curves, we show this is a um, finite number. If you count appropriately, we count um, all maps whose tropicalization, whose combinatorial type is fixed. And if you count this appropriately, and if you generalize some classical results in algebraic geometry to the log setup, you can show that zero strata in your moduli space is finite. And on the main theorem is saying this finite number we obtain by counting all these log maps whose tropicalization is a family of curves, tropical curves, is equal to the coefficients appearing in our flow tree formula. The proof uses the generation arguments. We degenerate. There is a gluing formula to describe gluing of flow maps and toric varieties. The main technicality of this proof is to relate the numbers appearing in the gluing formula to numbers that we calculate using our skew-symmetric Euler form and the river DT theory. And just a final minute, I will just make a remark. In progress, we are currently working on a correspondence relating directly to the DT invariants and blockers and cluster variety, not only to the coefficients appearing in the flow tree formula. As such, you can obtain a toric variety with the data of hypersurfaces from the data of the Cuba. If you blow up these hypersurfaces and look at the complement of the strict transform of D, that gives you a cluster variety. And in this cluster variety, you can look at counts of curves which touch the boundary at a single point. What we're currently writing up is a correspondence between all the counts of such A1 curves and um, quiver DT invariants directly and the situation when the attracted DT invariants are trivial. This is a heuristic picture. Your cluster variety, this is my last slide, admits the map to the space of stability conditions, you can imagine the projection of your A1 curves into this space. And these have to do with the walls appearing in the stability space of fluid DT invariants. So heuristically, these were expected to be related such kinds of curves with fluid DT invariants. And I will just stop here. Thank you very much for, the, for your attention. You get the toric variety from the data of the curve. It's for each decomposition of your dimension vector. So you fix the decomposition of your dimension vector. And uh, once you fix this decomposition, so uh, for instance, if you have two, one, you can fix the decomposition one, zero, plus one, zero, plus one, zero. And this will be a situation where things are not um, disjoint and now you need to go to one higher dimension and modify these vectors a little bit. But if everything is disjoint, you construct a toric variety whose rays are generated by these vectors that appear in the decomposition. So once you fix the decomposition, you construct a toric fan whose rays uh, contain these vectors appearing in the decomposition. And it might not be smooth if it's, say, um, or complete, if it's say one one, you have just one zero plus zero one. It's not corresponding to a projective toric variety. So we need to add more rays in general to these things. But I think more rays because of some invariance results of block Ramovitz and invariance under birational transformation is not going to change the result. So Fixing the dimension vector determines a bunch of rays in the fan of a toric variety, and we add some things to it to determine the exact toric variety. Yes. 
Yes. Yes. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yes. For again. Yes, so yes, so that's true. Actually. So you need to consider all possible decompositions. So, okay, so as you said, if you look at local PT for a fixed dimension vector gamma, there are like um, PT invariants for some stability parameter. And we are saying that we can obtain these PT invariants as a sum of all possible decompositions. So uh, for all possible decompositions, there are, for any decomposition, there are coefficients. And for any coefficients, we are relating these to a particular toric variety be obtained from this coefficient and the Gramovitan invariance of this particular toric variety. And we sum up all these all these different Gramovitan invariants and different toric varieties to obtain uh, the original DT invariants, which in this case we also know corresponds to the invariant. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, for instance, while uh, proving the SARA correspondence, we do know that by a, by a paper of Christian, this DT variants do are com calculated by wall crossing in the Christian stability diagram. And yes, so uh, on the left hand side, um, the, the question is not going to depend on this generic stability parameter theta. So fixing theta just brings you inside one chamber, and the left hand side is not is not going to depend on this particular stability parameter you start with. Um, maybe I can tell you more about that later. And whether giving the Yes, so Yeah, so you need to keep track of signs. That's correct, yes. Like the numbers I showed you, for instance, are just obtained from one particular theta when things are not trivial. And if you change the theta to another chamber, then you get a different uh, counting problem. But we fixed it a priori. Um, and we keep track of signs to, yeah, as Moran said, that's true. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. So we are, yeah, to show this main thing, we are showing that you can relate the combinatorics appearing in different setups of wall structures. So the main thing is to relate these wall structures in different setups. So, okay, in this question, we do match the wall structure appearing in the Prussian stability condition with the wall structure appearing widely count to A1 curves. And the main result we use to be able to do this matching is that our, in our paper with Mark Cross, we showed that 
you can purely from a combinatorial scattering diagram calculate these and that combinatorial mode structure we can match with this side. And um, that can also be related to the Murnach's scattered wall structure. Thank you.